Um, <coughs> Leslie, you and Donald come from slightly different backgrounds. Um, how did how did the concept of a lighting designer come about? I had no intention of being a lighting designer. I started out to be a stage manager. Now, stage managers have to either direct or act, and I didn't do either. So I learned to do lighting so I could sell myself as a stage manager. So about 10 years in, down into the, along the road of my career, I realized that I was a designer. I always thought I was an executive. There was no such thing as uh, an architectural lighting designer. I spent the first 10 years explaining what it was. You know, what do you do? Well, you see there's this thing we do with lights that makes your spaces look better. Oh. Well, that sounds very interesting. Uh, literally, there was there was no beaten path. I had the good luck to work for Bill Richardson, who came from theater. He taught me theater lighting, and then I got tired of not making a living, so I said, I want to do that architectural stuff you do. He said, okay. And that's how I became a lighting designer. <laughs> and then two years later, he joined an engineering firm, and I inherited his practice which was mostly hotels and the Hilton International account. And uh, you, you know my first partner was Martin Garin. Martin brought to the company uh, his client called Space Design Group, and I brought Hilton International. And on those two accounts, we started the office. And they were wonderful accounts because we could do beautiful things with space design. With Hilton, we met all kinds of architects and designers and. The practice just kept on growing. I, I don't have the words to compare how isolated we were. 99.5% of the lighting done at that time was done by reps, and not done very well. And nobody saw anything wrong with it. It would really be educational to take a look at the magazines of that period, what the lighting was like. It was all full blast, everything lighted evenly. You come along and say, you don't have to do it this way. There's a more interesting way to do it. They say, why? Uh, my rep told me this is fine. Why do you want to change it? So it was like climbing the Matterhorn to get people to understand that there was another way to do light. I remember very clearly the first time I saw the Seagram building, I not quite sure what year it was, what Richard Kelly had done. It was an earth-shattering experience because he had used light to, f to create pattern. His lighting of the lower level was a line of light connecting the columns. I remember turning to Martin, my partner, and saying, if I had wanted to do that, you wouldn't have let me. And then when I saw Kelly do uh, uh, the New York State Theater at uh, Lincoln Center, and you go into the upper lobby, and the, the lighting comes from nothing but lighted walls all through the space. And there are four accent lights, and the rest is all wall lighting. And it's a big space, going five or six stories. It just blew me away. That's, that's something we take for granted now, and play with, and, and vary. But it was earth-shattering then. And the whole idea that you didn't have to have this constant pattern of even light was unheard of. It all seemed to happen after the World War II was over. And I think it was prior to that time there were no hung ceilings. You really can't do lighting as we do it today without hung ceilings, or at least it's a whole lot harder. But once it became a place in which you could hide the fixture, the whole concept of light not seeing light as a presence rather than a physical, like the chandelier. Well, the hung ceiling led to being able to hide the source and just experience the light. I thought it was something while Don was talking. What we had in common, the 15 of us, and I think that not all 15 felt as strongly, was we all loved manipulating light. We were in love with what you could do with light. It was absolutely a crusade. Today's designers don't know what it is to fight for recognition, to have the entire world ignorant about what you've discovered. It was a crusade. The intern program was all Leslie's. Well, again, that's not... <laughs> it was her concept. She pushed it and um, made a great success from it. 
it was not an idealistic thing at all. We had reached the point which we are somewhat at again now, where we were stealing from each other's offices, and salaries started to go escalating. I said, this has got to stop. We can't afford it. What can we do? We'll bring more people in. And it, was, it was modeled on other societies and the young people there. Again, that has been in my life a great joy. All the young people that I helped to get started and followed their careers was a, a real turn on. Um, but it, w it has never been as idealistic as people would like to believe. It was, a, it was conceived as a way of bringing young people into the, the profession with the hope that they would become staff. What uh, direction would you give today's young lighting designer? Stay with it. Get into a good office and stay there. Today's lighting designer has got to know his technical stuff inside out. I learned everything I know by doing it wrong the first time and getting it right the second time. But uh, you can't do that today. It's too complicated. I, I was relating to the fact that it's really hard still to get a good education in lighting. There's Parsons, there's R R R RPI, Rensselaer. And you get mentioned in Colorado. Colorado turns out some very good people. Um, out here on the West Coast, it's very hard to get an education. But I think the best, get the theory, that's fine. Go to school and get the theory. Then apprentice yourself to someone who knows what they're doing. And stay put long enough to learn. We've had a lot of good people go through our offices. And some of them just didn't stay long enough. It, it's not something you learn overnight. I, I found, on the average, it takes five to six years to make a lighting designer. First you have to learn the technology, then you get to that point of, well, I could do it this way, and I could do it that way, and I could do it this way. Oh, God, which way should I do it? And they go through that stage, and all of a sudden it all falls into place, and they're lighting designers, but it's a slow process. And I still think the apprentice system works the best. Find someone good and stick around. Let's begin by um, your telling us how you got into lighting in the first place. It's very simple. It was by accident. <laughs> uh, I arrived in uh, the United States on August the 12th, 1965, as a recent graduate from Sheffield University in England. And by the way, as a history major, absolutely nothing to do with, with lighting. And, uh, headed off to Cincinnati to stay with the relatives who had volunteered to have me as, quote, their guest for 12 months or whenever I got the travel out of my system. And I had no job, so I went job seeking and contacted uh, oh, several companies in Cincinnati, Procter & Gamble, Cincinnati Bell, and Cincinnati Gas and Electric Company. And they said, we have a job as a lighting advisor. And I thought, what in heaven's name is, is that? And <laughs> I guess they were following the, the Betty Crocker kind of syndrome, that they had a department of ladies called Anne Holiday. And that was, that was our name for the, the lighting advisors who went out and talked to the general public, gave lighting suggestions to homeowners, worked with home builders, and they didn't require any prior, prior experience or knowledge, uh, just that you had a, a college degree and could put words together, and they said, we'll train you on the job. And, and I was hired. And that was my introduction to the lighting industry. And how did they train you? Uh, In-house training classes. Um, we were given lots of books to read, manufacturer's catalogs, uh, whatever textbooks were, were out there. And then we traveled around with one of the, quote, more experienced Anne Holidays. And finally, we were allowed to go and make a presentation and uh, go and call on homeowners. And I'd hate to go back and, and visit some of those uh, early suggestions. The poor homeowner's probably sitting there saying, what did this woman come and recommend? <laughs> uh, thinking back over the last century that before your birth included, um, <laughs> who, would you, you. who would you identify as the most significant figures in lighting from your perspective? I'm probably not going to, to land on traditional historical figures. Good. Um, for me, the, the people who had the, the most impact, I guess, fall into maybe two or three categories. 
uh, when I first came into the lighting industry, uh, there were a, a significant number of women who were playing a very important role in, uh, in, in lighting recommendations, working primarily for the, the major lamp companies. And I'm thinking of people like uh, Rose Coakley, um, Kay Layton, uh, Eileen Cutler. Um, they, they were really out there putting out useful information to the using public in an educational sense. Uh, at Sylvania, it was Jan Reynolds, and then uh, Betts Meehan, and of course Myrtle Fosbend uh, at Westinghouse. They, they were really significant educators uh, in those 1950s, 1960s era. Um, and then they, the second single person who springs to mind as being a great contributor to this industry is uh, an IES past president uh, by the name of Stephen Squillacci. Uh, at that point in time, when I first knew him, he was uh, the, the senior electrical person at Smith Hinchman and Grills Consulting Engineering Company in, in Detroit. And he had um, a great number of young graduate engineers who came through his department and ultimately became uh, who's who in the, in the lighting industry. And, and I won't name all of them because I'll probably forget somebody, but uh, two names spring to mind and people who are very active today in, in various roles, uh, Jim Benya and David Delora. And that he, he was a, a true educator and that he once said to me that he took the engineers who came out of the uh, school programs and then uh, proceeded to help them unlearn some of the academic things that they had been taught in order to be able to function in the real world. So he had a great impact that's lasted uh, through right now with uh, many of these people still practicing in the, in the lighting industry. Rita, as you know, I've been a member of the Designers Lighting Forum of New York uh, since the early 1980s. But tell me the, about the origins of the DLF. Where did it come from? It actually predated my coming into the, into the industry, but there, there was an organization called the, the Residence Lighting Forum uh, that was the, uh, the, the forerunner of the, the DLF. And it was started primarily, again, by the, the women in the, in the lighting industry that we talked about earlier on. Uh, they were sort of the movers and shakers in, in saying that there needed to be uh, an organization that addressed residential lighting um, and, and topics related to that that were not being covered by the local IES chapters, as they were then called. And there were several residence lighting forums that sprang up uh, around the, the country. And then, probably out of this New York area, I think the, the prime influence came from, from here, that we needed to expand uh, the subject area to, to deal with other applications than, than residential. That there was a need for these forum groups to focus more on, on the design and application issues that again weren't necessarily being discussed in local IES chapters. So that, that was the reason for, for their being. And they, they were highly successful around, around the country, San Francisco, Detroit, Minneapolis, New York, I mean, there were a lot of, of designers lighting forward. At some point in time, um, there was the concept that they really should be brought into the fold I'm not sure if that was jealousy on the part of the uh, the IES chapters who saw that these were quite successful in attracting audiences and uh, maybe it was time for the sections chapters then to, to look at covering the same subject areas. So there was an attempt to make the members of the Designers Lighting for a part of the, uh, the overall IES membership. And it frankly bogged down because of dues. Everything ultimately comes down to money. And the, the IES dues at that point in time were, I don't, I'm remembering something like $70, let's say. And most of the forum members had been paying 15 20 maybe $25. I think probably New York had the highest membership dues 
and there was just a great deal of reluctance to, to spend additional money to join what many believe not to be a worthwhile venture to get allied with the, the techie folks in, in IES. And also from an organizational standpoint, IES was going to have a hard time incorporating some of these people into the dues paying structure. So after a lot of uh, discussions uh, that went nowhere, um, it was decided that the uh, designers lighting forum groups would remain separate and go and do their own thing. Rita, talk a little bit more about the role of women in the lighting and electrical businesses um, in the last 40 years. Uh, there was an organization of, of which I was a member years ago, and I hate to admit I don't know if it still exists, uh, but it was the Electrical Women's Roundtable, and it had chapters throughout the United States, and its members consisted of women who worked for utility companies, for appliance manufacturers, uh, certainly those in the, in the lighting industry, uh, anybody who was in the, the electrical field. And uh, there were chapters of uh, 30 or more people in, in each of the, the cities, and they had an annual convention every year that probably drew about three or 400 women. So I, I don't think, while we, we might not have been uh, in evidence in huge numbers, uh, there was still a significant contribution coming from, from women in the, in the electrical industry. And, and still today, obviously, we see more and more women uh, who are in the uh, consulting engineering field, uh, designers, and working for manufacturers. Joanne, would you begin by telling us how you got into the field in the first place? Accidentally. Absolutely. I, um, I went to school for interior design and um, I married right after college and uh, we were traveling around because my husband was in a training program working for the steel industry and we finally, um, after several months of being in different places for training, uh, we wound up in Denver, Colorado. So I went with my little portfolio um, to get a job. And they said, you have a very nice portfolio, but you are 23 years old and you're married, so you're probably going to have kids pretty soon, so we can't hire you. So that led to 15 years of being a corporate housewife and a volunteer and having four kids and all of that. And uh, by the time the kids were in junior high school, we had um, he'd moved on to a new, new job and we'd move here to New Jersey. So. I hadn't done anything about a career for 15 years, so I decided I need to go back to school. So I decided to go to Parsons, and um, I took a class in lighting because uh, in my undergraduate uh, curriculum, lighting was just a layer that you put in when you put in the electrical and all of that, and uh, knew nothing about light. So I thought, that's an interesting subject. And my teacher happened to be Jim Knuckles, and uh, at the end of a year and a half, Jim called me up and he said, I have someone that I think needs your help. And, um, you know, would you like a job? And I said, sure, I'd love a job. And I, I thought, that's really interesting. I'll do that for six months. I'll learn a little more, more about lighting and go back into my field of interior design. And 30 years later, talk a little bit more about the work that you were doing on codes and who you were doing it with. Well, as a um, lot of things that um, have evolved in my career, my uh, involvement with the codes uh, was again by accident. Um, two of my friends who were very involved with uh, code issues, Hayden McKay and, and, and Sandra Stashik, invited me to go to a 90.1 ASHRAE meeting with them to see what it was all about because they knew in the practice that we were doing and the research we were doing that that I had a good um, source of information from, from my husband, the engineer, so they thought I might be interested. I made the mistake of going outside to either take a um, phone call or something and came back the, and, and found that I'd been nominating for the uh, 90.1 committee. So 
thinking about how you built up the the model, mm -hmm. uh, who worked with you to create the, if you will, standard practice uh, part of the model for the different designs? Did you have to do all that yourself? The uh, 90.1 subcommittee mm -hmm. didn't do this. The IES Energy Committee did it. So the, I, the much larger IES Energy Committee was supportive of the work of the six or seven uh, 90.1 subcommittee so members. So you brought the issue back to the larger right. committee mm -hmm. and said, here guys, right. help us out. Those folks that wrote me into being on that committee then got to be the, you know, the basis for doing all this research. And, and um, it sounds arduous, but it was a whole lot of fun. We had a really um, good time doing that. So who else was involved in that at the time? Well, Hayden McKay and mm -hmm. Sandra Sashik, and I um, can't remember all the people. But Dave Ranieri was the, uh, who um, works for Acuity, um, was then um, working for, you know, the Lithonia, and he, he headed the, the group that was the manufacturer's group that was assembling all the criteria, and they did a lot of um, computer runs to test the illumination levels and things like that. So they did all the hard mm -hmm. um, number crunching and, and, and uh, the designers, Carol Jones, of course, and, and she was uh, working for designer at the time and, and her work on the committee um, sort of informed her interest in energy and then she went on to, you know, a wonderful career with uh, Pacific Northwest Laboratories. So it, um, it informed the process, but it also helped those of us that, that were involved in this intense effort um, with, with their careers. It was a, a good, again, synergy. Yeah, the four horsewomen of the lighting apocalypse, right, right. I think. Joanne, talk a little bit about being a woman in the industry at that time mm -hmm. and in the lighting and um, engineering communities. Hmm. Well, there weren't very many. On, on my uh, floor where the small little lighting group was, um, I was the only woman in the lighting group and uh, the only other women within the vicinity were support um, staff and uh, personnel, people like that. So I was, you know, on my own as far as being a woman. Um, when I got involved with the IES, um, Speaking about mentors, another mentor was um, Sonny Sonnenfeld. One day he invited me out to lunch and he said, um, you know, I've got just the job for you. You know how those things start. Just the job for you. I think you should be the first president, woman president of the New York section. But before you take that job, you have to be Manny Ferris' uh, vice president and make sure he does all the stuff he's supposed to do. So. Um, I said, okay, that sounds interesting. I wasn't even on the board, but he was convinced it was a job for me. So I joined the board and became Manny Ferris' uh, VP. And indeed, there was a lot to sort of keeping track of things that Manny was supposed to do. And and we got to be lifelong friends because of it. But uh, Sonny and Sonnenfeld was responsible for that. So talk some more about the challenges of pioneering in this respect, being mm -hmm. a woman in the, in the lighting business? Well, particularly within um, an engineering environment, if you weren't an engineer, it was hard to be taken seriously. One of the things I had to do at that firm was to um, introduce lighting to the new uh, engineers to give them an overview, and it was always a, a lunch session, so they'd come for the free lunch and then have to listen to the lecture. And I remember giving them problems of, you know, light this elevator lobby to um, average of 20 foot candles, and I'd often get one luminaire that put, you know, 40, uh, 400 foot candles in one place and nothing every place else. And so it was, it was fun getting to know the engineers and how their their uh, minds worked and and persuading them that there's another dimension to light beyond the calculations. Leslie Wheel was a mentor from the time I joined the ILD until she moved out west, and still she was uh, a mentor over the phone. 
uh, Leslie Wheel started an internship for, for people, and, and she and I and uh, a woman named uh, Deborah Roth, who went on to a career as a Unitarian minister, but she and I and, and Leslie were the only women in the field in, in New York at that time, early wow. on. And so do you think it's different today? Oh, yes, I think women predominate. Don't I, I really do. If I not in numbers, at least in quality? <laughs> well, I think everybody, you know, a lot of people do a good job, but they seem to be as many, if not more, women in the field than there are men. Mm -hmm. Francesco, why don't we start with how you joined the lighting industry in the first place? Um, yeah, I had the opportunity um, and I, uh, I went after it. I was first um, at the Open Atelier of Design and Architecture with Beppe Zambonini, who is this wonderful visionary architect. And at the end of a term, there was a jury, and Carol Klein was one of the um, jurors. And the next day, Carol called me, and he said, would you like to work for me? So I didn't really even know what lighting design was, um, but I needed a job. And I spoke with Beppe and with some of the other designers at the school. And Beppe said, this is a fabulous opportunity. Carol is the best lighting designer. And um, architectural lighting is a very new young field. And so you really be getting in on it. And another one of the interior designers who had some experience was a woman, said to me, as a woman, this is a great opportunity because it's all open to you. And you have to remember at that time, um, you would go into an architect's office and there would be no women in the architectural office. There certainly would be no principals. They were more in interior design. But it was really um, a very different world. And so the idea that you had an open field, it was new and it was good for a woman was very enticing. And so I started working for Carol, I think, the next day. That's fantastic. What was it like in the office? What did, what did you actually do the first year or so that you were there? Well, um, one of the things about Carol is he loved and knew a lot about sources and lamps. And so at that point, it was just Carol and I. And so my first assignment was to find some par 36, 44, 15s. And I didn't have any idea what that meant, but I was calling around to the different uh, suppliers looking for a PAR 36 4415. Uh, a 4415 is a fog lamp for a tractor. And at the time, uh, Carol was working on a, an exhibit at the Custom House of, um, from the Museum of the American Indian. They were putting on a show down there. and. Um, a 4415 has a beam that's 5 by 40. And so for the totem poles, it was the exact beam that was right for it. So that was, I began to understand that lamps had, you know, a uh, different lamps had different effects. Carol got a call from Jim Knuckles, who was another one of the leaders of lighting design at that time. I mean, it was important in lighting design. And Jim wanted to set up a company which was really a, um, a group of lighting designers. And they turned out they were lighting designers and also interior designers, where you shared the same space and you used the same, you know, sort of library and things like that, the same resources. And um, Carol decided that that would be a good thing to do. So he asked me to come along with him. So I went with Carol, and I worked just for Carol, really, and it was, you know, it was the beginning of a very long and, um, and uh, deep friendship, 
and um, he was m mentoring me. Because it was a very new company and the other people in the company started falling by the wayside, I was very sort of quickly maneuvered into the position of being one of the three. So I had greatness thrust upon me. <laughs> and from there, uh, how mm -hmm. did the firm evolve? Well, um, we were in the uh, we were in the Flatiron Building at the time. Uh, we moved to nearby to um, 22nd Street to um, a, what was a conversion of a loft. We were the first people there, and then Leslie Wheel came in after us down below. And she was downstairs. She worked, and she was always at the aisle the um, meetings. But I think that she was a very um, significant. Uh, energy and force in education and uh, for young people and encouraging them and she was also a woman one of the first women lighting designers you know in the field that was very successful uh, are there other figures from the early days of your career that you would identify as having significant influence on your development um, I think that Edison Price and Edison Price, because he um, and his company and the people, Isaac Goodbar and the people that he worked for, were really so instrumental in creating what has become the, what was the workhorse of like the Visionaire and the Humanaire, the first one by four and the first two by two that were, I don't know if they were the first, but the, you know, certainly right there that, um, that was the standard of the industry for so very long. And um, also because he was always interested in um, designing new fixtures and uh, for, special, uh, uh, for special projects. And I think I mentioned to you before that um, when we would go and we were looking, when we were thinking about what kind of a fixture would maybe get that kind of light, it would be, a, you'd identify it by the name. Oh, that was the PepsiCo strip, or that was the LBJ stack light. You know, it was always related to some great project. And uh, I think that his creativity and genius was certainly, which I was in a way closer to because Carol's relationship with him and, you know, sort of learning about that. I don't know if someone at another firm would be as aware of it as I was. Um. So tell me about a lighting project that you found particularly challenging. Orange County Performing Arts Center. And Cesar Pelli, by the way, was the architect of the Overture project in mm -hmm. Madison and also the architect of the Orange County one. They have these wonderful, wavy, undulating surfaces of the balconies on every level. And in the rendering, which everybody had fallen in love with, there's this beautiful glow. So how are we going to solve that? Now this is, this is going back to this fascination with sources that I caught from Carol that, and the potential for things. It was about 10 or 12 years ago, I think it was the IES, put on a show over down at Cooper Union and they had new sources and I think it was someone from Hewitt Packard was there, an engineer. And he was talking about the promise of a source called an LED. And we were in this um, auditorium, it was dark and he darkened it. He described how they worked and then, you know, that it was a different kind of light source. And he took what was like a flashlight and I think it was a one watt or three watt and it was red. And he beamed it across the entire auditorium. And I came back and I said to Stephen, that's the new, that's the new source. That's what lighting's going to be. And I went in and from then on I put, tried to put it on every project. I was working on Time Warner Center and I'd go into this, all I could find was somebody lent me a strip at that point, you know, that was, and I'd go into a room, 30 men, because <laughs> that's what it was, you know, what it was like, the, um, you know, the, the uh, owners, the big developers. And I'd say on the top of this building, this building is going to be finished in the new century. You know, this was in the 90s. And you want a f source of the 21st century on your building. And it's like this. It's magic. And they s 
said, okay. Talk a little bit about being a woman in the industry at that time mm -hmm. and in the lighting and um, engineering communities. Hmm. This is going back to the old days mm -hmm. um, of what is where being from New York and then going, I, I was mentioning to you before that I've done a lot of work in New Orleans. So um, first project I worked down in there was the Hotel Intercontinental and Perez was the architect. So I was at the meeting and I went into the, uh, the restroom and first of all, all the women, there were no women architects there. All the women are, had, you know, like big hair and they had their heels on and they were all, you know, um, all, we were all darling and it was almost like something in a movie. I went into the, to the, to the restroom and there was set up hot curlers already cooking and hairspray and all of this whole cosmetic <laughs> array. And I thought, wow, I am in another dimension. So um, that's changed. That's no longer true. But there were not only the working there is not necessarily only what is it like to work with on the team or the, um, you know, who the uh, electrical engineer is and blah, blah, blah. It's, it's also what is the culture? What do they expect of you as a person? Tell us how you began in lighting in the first place. Okay, well, I didn't have a job. That's how I got into lighting. I, I came up uh, from North Carolina, um, and I came up to go to school and went to Brooklyn, and I found a job at New York Telephone Company. It was Bell Telephone Company at the time. And after about six months, I got laid off. And I looked in the ad, I looked at an ad, I actually was in the Daily News, <laughs> And there was a place called Rainbow Agency. I went for an interview at Lighting Services. Uh, and it was at 39th Street and Park Avenue. And it was, I, I got to the building. It was called a Griffin Hotel. And I got to the building and I went inside. And I, I never forget the, the old man Barney, the doorman, says, oh, no, you have to go around the side. So I went around the side where the ash cans were down a flight of stairs in an alley and down in this little place was lighting services and I said oh my god what am I getting into but I walked into it, uh, the place and there was this lady there and she said my name is Essie Gloger and and who are you and I'm, I'm like well I'm applying for the job so I went in and I met Essie and then I met Marvin Gelman and they were going to pay me this huge salary, $80 a week. I mean, I was making $69.50 a week, so that was a big, big increase. And I met Marvin, and he took me into his office, and, and his, I shouldn't call it an office, his space. And <laughs> his desk had a pile of papers on one side, and you could barely see his head, and he asked me a few questions. And so I started working at Lighting Services, and I was answering the phone. I typed five invoices a week. <laughs> we had about eight people in Rockland County doing the manufacturing. And then when I was introduced to the personnel, uh, I met Paul Morantz, who was our designer, and we had Bill Burquist and one other guy who was a draftsman. And that was the, and then Marvin, uh, who had come out of the theater, Marvin was doing um, consulting, and he'd go and do focusing, and we'd do the Went to Antique show and loan fixtures and all that. And we had one guy there who reminded you of... Um, I'm sure you saw the Lucy show years ago where they were going through the country and uh, they got stopped and the guy was the sheriff and then he took him into town. He was the judge. He was everything. We had one guy who did everything. He did the orders. He did the invoices. He did everything. And I was just naturally nosy. I started to ask questions. You know, I'm a Southern girl from North Carolina and I came up and I went to live with my uncle in Brooklyn and I started going to... Uh, City University at night, and, and I was struggling, and, and really, really country. I probably still am, but anyway, really country. And this whole New York thing, although I had relatives here, I used to come for summers and all that, so I wasn't unfamiliar with New York, but, but to come into this whole, this whole lighting thing was like, what, lighting? I, I, don't, I don't think so, but when I got in here, 
uh, and now look around even even today as far as African American people I still can count them almost on my face. I don't know why because it's a fascinating great business. Tell us how your career has developed since that time and that was roughly when? 19, you ready for this? I am. Okay, I'm only 10 now but anyway that was 1969. Fantastic. I became what, what, what we call a national accounts manager uh, I can remember, actually, when I was showroom manager, I remember saying to Marvin, uh, he had a director of marketing and all that, and, and they'd travel around the country, and I'd say, why don't you ever send me around? Why can't I go? And he said, yeah, but uh, you're married. I mean, you got a daughter. I said, and what's your point? Uh, I said, why don't you allow me to worry about that? Because I really want to get around the country. I want to see more of what's going on. And at that point, I started to travel around the country. Um, with the director of marketing, and, and uh, we'd meet with our reps, and we'd go see some customers and all of that. And that's how I got to know so many people across the country. Uh, then after that stint, he hired another showroom manager. I became his national accounts manager, meaning that, yeah, we had yeah, 10 big accounts. But anyway, they were all over the country, got involved with Nordstrom Stores and a lot of other people like that who demanded the attention. And that's how that whole thing happened. Talk about your association with um professional associations such as the IES and the IALD and the DLF and how you became involved and what you continue to do. Before that, the IES, let's face it, I call it a good old boys thing. I mean, that's really what it amounted to. And back in those days, too, you didn't find too many women. I mean, Joanne Lindsley was around on Leslie. That's, you know, and then later on Ad Addison and all that. But most of the time, their name, women just weren't talked about. I can remember Leslie Wheel coming to Marvin saying there are kids that their their kids in school they need they need a job for the summer and she just pushed and then before you knew it people like us a little niche manufacturer light Alia, all of us were hiring these kids um in college for the summer in addition to walking around and actually seeing it for yourself what would you recommend for people entering the industry to help develop their skills and train them train themselves professionally some classes some some education. I think we have to just open ourselves up more with the organizations. I think we have to take a look at the programs we, we're, we're presenting. Uh, they have to be um, interesting, but, but also uh, I think we ought to be talking more to the whole scope of people. I think we ought to be doing lamp companies, we ought to be doing manufacturers, we ought to be doing anybody who's involved in ballast folk, um, 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 transformer people. The, the only way you can really learn what this business is all about, you got to get knee deep in it. Uh, the surface stuff just does, doesn't work. Don't just stay on your page. You got to flip to the other pages. You got to know not only about the lamps, but you got to know about the, all the swords. When you're in a manufacturing business, uh, I want to even know about an on-off switch sometimes and, and, and that kind of thing. Barbara, in, in all your conversations, you haven't talked at all about issues facing a black woman in the lighting industry, which is clearly white and male dominated. It was definitely all male, all white male, and a lot of swearing. I mean, and we dealt with, we dealt with distributors and with contractors. And so the hardest thing ever for me to get rid of was, was, was all the swearing. Then I can remember being in the showroom, um, and I can remember prospective clients walking in, and they say, well, I'd like to, um, speak to the, um, like to see the manager. And uh, I'd say, I, I am the manager. Oh, oh, really? And I'd actually had occasion that I had to go back and get Marvin or somebody and, and bring him up and um, have him say, no, no, she's the manager. She knows what she's doing. And this particular guy is from South Africa and uh, I was a, Posed to lay out his clubs and help him with his lighting, he absolutely said, "I'm not, I'm not doing it. I'm not dealing with her." And so Marvin came forth and said, "Well, you know what? If you don't deal with Barbara, I guess we won't be dealing with you." And that's another thing I admired about him. He always stood up for for the right thing. She had, she knows what she's doing. She has the savvy, the knowledge, and she, this is her job to do this. It's not my job, so I'm not going to bring in anybody else to take care of you. You either do it or you don't. Well, he did it. Took him a while. He walked away uh, with his head between his legs, and then eventually he bought the equipment. 
And we were never friends, but I did get a, a little bit of respect from him after that. I don't know any other um, black female person around in this business who's, first of all, been around as long as I have, and secondly, has the reputation that I have. So, and I think that emanated because, first of all, I love people, and I love to talk. I mean, that's pretty obvious. Um, and then I care about what I do. I have a passion for what I do. And I think uh, people recognize that in me, that I honestly, whatever I, I put my foot forward to do is, is, I believe in what I do. I love people. So the other aspect of it, being African American, being whatever, never, I never looked back. I just kept going. If you look back at your career so far, um, what would you say you most recognize as a legacy, the thing that you're proudest of accomplishing? My hats. My hat collection. Everybody will say that. <laughs>